On the 17th of July, 1918, at a house in the Soviet city of Yekaterinburg, the Romanov Imperial Royal Family of Russia stand terrified and shaking in front of a firing squad. Tsar Nicholas II, along with his wife and five children, were brutally shot in cold blood by the communist Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were terrorists. They wanted a reign of blood, and they wanted the blood of the Romanovs. But rumors soon started to circulate that there may have been a survivor. Grand duchesses had diamonds um, stitched into their corsets, and it acted as a bulletproof vest, basically. Two years later, a young woman discovered in a Berlin hospital came forward claiming to be Princess Anastasia Romanov. And indeed, she really did look like her. Her features were very similar. For nearly a hundred years, researchers and investigators searched for the truth. What they discovered was one of the most chilling royal deaths of all time. It wasn't an execution. It was a murder. To this day, the deaths of the Romanov family remains one of the most controversial subjects in Russian history. It was a murder mystery that spanned nearly a century, attracting the attention of numerous professional and amateur investigators. It pushed the boundaries of forensic research and was the subject of countless conspiracies, including the theory that one of the daughters may have survived. The Romanovs had ruled over Russia since 1613, during which time the country had become one of the largest economic and military powers in the world. The Romanov family were the last in the line of a 300-year-old dynasty that ruled Russia. Traditionally in Russia, the Tsar and Tsaritsa had always been viewed as these semi-divine beings. And they believed themselves as godlike. They believed in the divine right of kings. Many peasants would see the Romanovs, and Nicholas in particular, almost as a religious iconic figure. He was head of the Russian Orthodox Church. Nicholas and Alexander were not indifferent to the people. In fact, they admired the simple Russian peasant and their devotion to God and their powerful sense of belief. There was the most enormous respect and affection from most classes, really, for the Tsar and his family. But times were changing. The life of the ordinary peasant was miserable. Often they lodged in the same single room hovel with their animals on earthen floors with a hole in the roof for the smoke to escape. As life in Russia grew increasingly hard for the common people, a greater divide began to grow between them and the Tsar. Russia in the early 20th century was a very complex society. A peasant society still flourished. So it was a country struggling to enter the 20th century. The vast population were, of course, the peasant population who lived the poorest, poorest lives imaginable. The Romanov dynasty were ruling like an 18th century monarchy, and we were in a 20th century country. There was something horribly wrong there and completely out of sync. At his coronation, he said, I shall maintain the principle of autocracy just as firmly and unflinchingly as it was preserved by my dead father. You cannot have a communist or Soviet system coexisting with an autocratic royal family. It's not going to work. And because of that, really, he set in train his own path to his own terrible end. But the turning point came from what became known as Bloody Sunday. We, the working men and inhabitants of St. Petersburg, come to the sire to seek defense. On Sunday, the 22nd of January, 1905, 
a crowd of over 3,000 people, including women and children, marched on the Tsar's residence in St. Petersburg. It was intended to be a peaceful protest, aimed at highlighting the poor working conditions of Russia's peasant workforce. Thousands of people marched on the Winter Palace with petitions, demands for better working conditions to alleviate poor, the, the, the poverty. The Cossacks fired warning shots over the heads of the crowds and then fired into the crowds when they didn't disperse. It is estimated that over 130 people died from the shooting, but many more lost their lives in the ensuing stampede as people tried to flee from the gunshots. Even though Nicholas was not in St. Petersburg at the time, and nor did he give the order to open fire on the crowd, the events of that Sunday gave rise to huge resentment against the Tsar. Much of the respect and much of the love for Nicholas II instantly evaporated that day. And that was the spark, really, that lit the Russian Revolution. Under Tsar Nicholas, Russia was undergoing a period of severe political, social and economic hardship. To make matters worse, by 1914, the world was seeing the onset of the Great War. In fear of a German invasion, Nicholas approved the mobilization of his troops, which was viewed as an act of aggression. Germany declared war on Russia. And Germany was so much better prepared, whereas Russia simply wasn't, and the losses were almost incalculable. World War I may be hell in the West. It is pure hell, 10 times over for the Russian. The cost of World War I on the Russian people was catastrophic. They had lost over 3 million soldiers to fighting and nearly 1 million civilians to disease and starvation. Russia was on the brink of economic and military collapse. The peasants, who were bearing the brunt of the hardship, put the blame firmly on Nicholas. You saw the imperial family sleepwalking towards disaster. You saw them teetering on the precipice of the Russian Revolution, still living in such great opulence, still blind to the fact that their people were being slaughtered in droves in World War I. The mounting grievances of their people along with the increased instability of the country, meant that the Romanov family were heading towards the complete eradication of their 300-year-old dynasty. In 1917, under increasing pressure from the provisional government led by Alexander Kerensky, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia had no other option but to abdicate. He had hoped in doing so, it would guarantee the safety of his family. He made the decision to abdicate um, while he was still at the front in command of the Russian army. Uh, he was a long way away from his family, 600 miles away, and he had to make a very difficult and dramatic decision. One has to admire him because he felt he was doing the best thing for Russia. Nicholas II actually returned to Zaske Silo, to the Alexander Palace, which is where he and the family had lived since the birth of the Tsarevich. Now, in the meantime, while he'd been traveling back, his wife, Alexandra, who was at the palace with the five children, had been placed under house arrest. And when Nicholas came back, he too was effectively told, you're now a prisoner, you're under house arrest here. They were no longer the imperial family. He was Colonel Romanov, and his family were no longer the imperial family. Nicholas and his family were put under house arrest at the Alexander Palace partly as punishment, but mainly for their own protection.
Kerensky and the provisional government genuinely feared for his safety. It was very difficult for the new provisional government to placate the various different groups within Russia, some of whom wanted Nicholas to be taken out effectively and tried and shot. While confined to the palace, Kerensky allowed them to live in relative peace and afforded them many of the usual comforts they were used to. They still had a degree of freedom insofar as they could still go out into part of the park that surrounded the Alexander Palace. And Nicholas was always very keen on taking exercise, so you'd see them rowing on the lake and that kind of thing. Despite being under arrest, Nicholas, who was now released of his duties, relished the time he now had to spend with his family. He paid close interest to his youngest daughter, Anastasia, who was described as a bright and mischievous child. They shared a love for the outdoors and would often be seen climbing trees and playing together in the snow. Nicholas was almost transformed into a completely different character. He seemed to have taken it rather well or dispassionately. But then again, the imperial family believed in fate. They were deeply religious people, so they believed that anything that happened to them was sent by God to try them. And my goodness, would, you know, would that come home and haunt them? After several months of peaceful confinement in St. Petersburg, the situation in Russia had started to grow increasingly hostile. Sooner or later, the mob uh, in Petrograd uh, were going to come down to Saskia Silo, which is only 15 miles away, probably storm the palace and try and haul out Nicholas and Alexander and kill them. It was decided that they were to be moved further away, away from Saskia Silo, and they were moved almost 2,000 miles from St. Petersburg to Siberia, to the town of Tobolsk. Tobolsk is a town in the Tyumen Oblast region of Russia and the former capital of Siberia. Kerensky had requisitioned the governor's mansion to accommodate the Tsar and his family. Here they were to spend the coming winter months, hidden away from the dangers of the ongoing revolution. And the reason they chose Tobolsk was that it was effectively cut off for a good six months of the year by snow and ice and the rivers were frozen, there was no railway. And at the time, it seemed a very secure place to move the family to. Clearly, this was a little bit of a come down from living in a royal palace, but it was, it was still a reasonably civilized, uh, you know, surroundings and standard of life. Primarily for that family, as long as they were together and allowed to see the world outside and take fresh air and walk and, and, and be a family, that is what they clung to. And that really is what kept them going. And then come the 10 days that shake the world. The masses take charge of their destiny. With rifle, bayonet, machine gun, the Bolsheviks seize power. By October, the Bolshevik party had overthrown Kerensky's government and seized control for themselves. Well, the Bolsheviks were, were what became the Communist Party, founded by Lenin in 1905. And they rose to power, really, on the fall of the Tsar, but also the ineptitude of the provisional government. You know, they, theirs was a reign of terror. The Bolsheviks were terrorists. They wanted a reign of blood, and they wanted the blood of the Romanovs. This is the dictatorship of the proletariat, a power won and maintained by violence, power that is unrestricted by any laws, resting directly on force. Keep this well in mind. The moment the Bolsheviks took over, probably all chance and all hope of getting out began to fade very rapidly. And yet they, they, they found the good in it, they found the positives, and they said things like, you know, so long as we can stay together, so long 
as we have each other, we'd be quite happy to carry on living here. They would have been more than grateful just to be allowed to live out their lives somewhere like that and just be a, a, a loving and supportive family. But everything changed. The white Russians rebel against the Reds' peace effort. Allied troops fight to keep Russia in the war. While the family were at Tobolsk, fierce fighting broke out across Russia between the new Bolshevik government and the anti-communist White Army. The pro-royalist White Russians, who wanted the Tsar reinstated, were now closing in on the house in Tobolsk. The Bolsheviks holding the Romanovs decided they had to move them somewhere even more secure, where they could keep even tighter control over them, which was the city of Yekaterinburg. They were moved to a former merchant's home called Ipatiev House in the city of Yekaterinburg in the Russian Urals. This was to be a far cry from anything the family had ever experienced before. Known by the Bolsheviks as the House of Special Purpose, it was to become the scene of one of the most horrific events in Russian history. Just as the family arrived, a large wooden palisade was erected all around the front of the house. People wanted to see, but because the palisade was there, they were warned off in no uncertain terms. All of their luxuries were taken away from the family, and they were now under constant guard. They were prisoners. They were imprisoned. Only their most faithful servants were allowed to go with them including Alexandra's maid and Alexei's physician, Dr. Botkin. They came out to use the lavatory or the bath. There were guards standing there. They were watched and very, very closely confined. It was pretty grim. They weren't allowed the ministrations of a priest. Um, food was rationed. Um, Nicholas and Alexandra both said that, um, that the regime there was hostile to them and they felt under threat. There were machine guns in the top of the house. There was a machine gun point in the garden. There was a machine gun in the basement. It had been turned into a fortress, effectively. It soon became apparent to Nicholas that any hope of salvation was rapidly fading away, along with their chances of surviving captivity. There wasn't an awful lot else that they could do, um, apart from pray for their delivery. The person in charge of their imprisonment and the man responsible for the conditions they were living under was Yakov Yurovsky, a fully-fledged Bolshevik and committed Marxist who was described by the local people as a dangerous man. In the Tsar's letters, um, he said he was more than unnerved by Yurovsky and that he sort of had the measure of an evil, evil man. So I'm sure there was a presentiment that they were not safe. They were surrounded by very hostile people. By July 1918, the Romanovs had been at Ipatiev House for nearly 78 days. The confinement, fear, and living conditions had taken their toll on the family. But around midnight on the 17th of July, a glimmer of hope, as news arrived that they were to be moved. The White Russians were closing in on the Katerinburg, so salvation might have been at hand. In fact, what happened, the family woken up about two in the morning and told that the situation was getting too dangerous in Ekaterinburg. There was too much shooting going on and they would have to move them down in the basement and there they would wait in the basement and a truck would come to take them somewhere else. So they got dressed and came down to the basement quite literally, lambs to the slaughter. But it soon became clear to the family that their captors had no intention of letting them leave. The moment only came when Yurovsky stood in front of the Tsar with a piece of paper and said, 
by order of the Akachimbo Executive Committee, you are going to be shot. And Nicholas was so taken aback, he actually asked him to repeat it. And Jurovsky read it a second time. And then, once he'd finished, he then took the Colt revolver from his pocket and shot the Tsar in the chest. This sort of fusillade rings out in this tiny little room, and several bullets hit him in the chest. smoke died down, it was clear and obvious most of the royal family are still alive. Nicholas is dead. He's killed instantly. Because all the assassins wanted to shoot Nicholas first, they, the others started screaming and running around the room. And that's when carnage began. And gunshot after gunshot rings through this room. The two older grand duchesses clung to one another. It was a horrible, chaotic scene. Olga ended up being shot through the jaw. There was screaming, there was blood and brains and God knows what else. Countless bullets must have gone into these poor people's bodies. Vomit, blood, brain matter. I can't imagine how indescribably horrible that was, that scene. But it was no neat execution. Yurovsky ordered that the bodies of the Romanov family be taken away and buried in unmarked graves at a secret location. Yurovsky had arranged for a fiat truck to come at a appointed hour and be waiting outside the Palisades, gunning its engine, ready for the bodies to be loaded and taken out to this site they had wrecked out in the Kopchaki forest. This fiat truck trundled off, overloaded with all these bodies into the forest. It took hours and hours to get where it should in the forest because it kept sinking in the mud and getting stuck. They were to be taken nine miles into the forest to a place called the Four Brothers Mine. And they start dropping them down what they thought was a mine working to discover that it was only about eight feet deep and very shallow and full of water wasn't deep enough for, for the family. And Yurovsky takes one look and says, well, I'm sorry, chaps. We're all going to have to come back tomorrow and take the bodies somewhere else, because uh, the monarchists and the local peasants are going to find them in five minutes. They had to all come back the next day, drag them out of this water-filled hole, put them back in the truck, and the plan was to take them off 10 miles north of the city to a proper mine and dump them down there. But of course, this Fiat truck, again, kept getting stuck in the mud. And eventually, Yurovsky, completely exhausted, just capitulated and said, right, that's it. We just dump them here. <laughs> There's a horrible dimension to this story which almost descends into black comedy, and that was the in gross ineptitude in the planning and execution of the murders themselves. He totally, totally misjudged the process by which you, you, you bury um, a, a relatively large group of individual people. He just didn't work out how physically demanding, time-consuming it would be. They were finally buried, if you like, in this pit with railway sleepers, wooden railway sleepers put over them and the truck backwards and forwards over the railway sleepers to push them down. Two of the children were not amongst them. And as we shall see, it's that decision that will have fateful consequences in many decades to come. The Russian authorities admitted to killing Tsar Nicholas, 
but would neither confirm nor deny what had happened to his family. The exact fate of the Romanovs remained a mystery to all but those involved in the events at Apatiev House. The Bolsheviks admitted Nicholas had been shot. That was a fait accompli. The Tsar was dead. And the news of that got out quite quickly. But that certainly didn't include the Grand Duchesses or Alexei, um, which opened the door, really, for all of the conspiracy theories that possibly one of the Grand Duchesses, either Anastasia or Maria, had, had survived, or that the Tsarevich had survived, actually, and been spirited away. The Russian government never took responsibility. And because they never took responsibility, they felt, understandably, they had no obligation to answer secondary questions about, oh, who was killed then? It seemed as if the mystery of the Romanovs would remain confined to the history books. But in 1920, a young woman, apparently suffering from amnesia, was found in the German city of Berlin. She was taken to a mental asylum where she was described by the hospital staff as German-speaking, but with a Russian accent. She carried no official papers and refused to identify herself. She was known only as Anna Anderson. Well, Anna Anderson was discovered in an asylum in Berlin, I think in 1920, so two years after the murder of the Imperial family. Shortly after arriving at the hospital, Anderson, who had previously stated that she had no memory of her former life, made the astonishing claim that she was none other than Anastasia Romanov. And she spent much of her life trying to convince the world that she really was Anastasia. And indeed, she really did look like her. Her features were very similar. And if you look at young pictures of Anastasia and pictures of a middle-aged Anna Anderson, you can see why a lot of people might be gulled into thinking they're one and the same person. No one knows what happened to Anastasia, and yet there's this woman who'd come out of Europe and had come up with this story that she'd been rescued by this peasant who had taken her all the way across Russia and into Europe and then to her freedom. Even by 1968, Anna Anderson was still pursuing the claim that she was the lost princess Anastasia Romanov. She even took the matter to the German courts in hope of gaining official recognition. The Anastasia claim, the Anna Anderson claim, went on for decades. She was in and out the courts being, you know, and there were rival camps of supporters and detractors, and the whole Anastasia controversy went on and on and on. Yes, it seemed fantastic, but it was a time of fantastic stories. And furthermore, people really wanted to believe it. They really wanted to believe that this beautiful, playful, mischievous princess was still alive and well. By this opportunity, I thank all my friends everywhere uh, who have been assisting me in all my troubles uh, uh, all these many years. And basically, the Russians kind of sat back and let them get on with it, because all the time, no, no one could work out what happened. It suited them, because they didn't have to admit to what they'd done. The courts dismissed her claim due to lack of evidence but she remained adamant of her identity right up until her death in 1984. Was there any truth to her story? Could Anna Anderson have been the missing Romanov daughter? It seemed like a question no one would ever be able to answer. Until a monumental discovery was made in the Siberian Urals. In 1991, a Russian archaeologist makes, frankly, the discovery of a lifetime. After a lot of careful research, he discovers the exact spot where the Romanovs are buried. It's unearthed, and there are all these corpses, and they match the Romanovs. You know, there's a man, the right height as the Tsar. There's a woman, the right age. You know, the skeletons match. This is, you know, going to close the story. The scientists say it's nearly 100% certain that these are indeed the bones of the last Tsar and his family. The bodies found in Yekaterinburg were forensically proven to be the Romanovs. But there was a problem. If we have the remains of Romanovs, two bodies are still missing, and it is a mystery. 
was controversial historical accounts on this, whether they were buried, buried separately or survived, who knows. Two of the bodies are missing, that of Anastasia and her brother Alexei. Where are they? All the time those two children's bodies were missing, he could still claim, ah, oh, but there's two bodies missing, maybe two of them got away. And as a result of this, the myth or the story or the legend that Anastasia survived continues, and it continues for a very long time. If the family had all died in the basement of a Patiev house, why were they not buried together? Speculation started to circulate about why Alexei and one of his sisters were not with the rest of their family. There was a theory at the time that Anastasia may have survived the hail of gunshots. The people in charge of, of, of uh, confining them were basically local revolutionaries. They weren't people who had been brought in from Moscow or anywhere else. These were not trained assassins. They were not sharpshooters. Some of the killers had little or no experience of how to handle a gun. Each man was told which member of the royal family he was to shoot at. They didn't really want to know about shooting a child. They were only there as part of the execution party to kill Nicholas Romanov. It was quite prestigious, after all, to be able to say that you were guarding Nicholas the Bloody, the awful ex-emperor. You could imagine the fog from all of those guns blazing, but the Grand Duchesses didn't die. There was even a suggestion that she may have unwittingly protected herself against the bullets. During the course of their captivity, the girls in particular had progressively sewn rubies, diamonds and emeralds into their corsets. I suppose they still clung on to the hope that they were going to get out of this situation, and they wanted to get out of the situation with as much of the valuables that they had taken with them. We don't really know. We can, I mean, forensically, I don't know the sequence of how they died, except that I think the girls were definitely wounded and screaming and huddled together in a corner. It became apparent very quickly that it looked as though the bullets were ricocheting off them. The guards tried to finish them off with bayonets, and they were even inept trying to bayonet the poor girls. Of course, the bayonets were not able to get through the camisoles that the girls were wearing. It's nearly 75 years to the day since the family was shot at this house in Ekaterinburg. The daughters had filled their corsets with hidden jewellery, which deflected the bullets, and they had to be attacked with bayonets. It may be that as they were carted away, Anastasia and Alexei escaped. So if Anastasia did survive, how could she have escaped? The bodies were dragged out of the cellar, at which point one of the Grand Duchesses still showed signs of life. Now, this was given as kind of fact, and I've no way of disputing it or, or no, but when the bodies were being brought out on stretchers, one of the Grand Duchesses, which is thought to have been Anastasia, actually sat up covering her face with her hands and screamed. So whether a sympathetic guard had rescued one of them, it's, uh, it, it's not beyond the realms of, of possibility. Again, the focus was put onto the now deceased Anna Anderson. Could she have been telling the truth? Was she really the lost Grand Duchess Anastasia Romanov? By 1994, Advancements in DNA allowed the authorities to test a tissue sample that had been gathered from Anna Anderson 20 years before. Tissue sample was discovered from a hospital where she'd had um, some kind of bowel operation, and that, of course, was tested for DNA. So they have to find a DNA match with someone alive who's related to the Romanovs. And in fact, the investigators go to no less a figure than Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, the husband of the Queen of Britain. Prince Philip is related to the Tsarina Alexandra through his maternal bloodline. 
Investigators were able to cross-reference his DNA with both the Romanov remains and the Anna Anderson tissue sample. After extensive testing, the highly anticipated results were revealed to the world at an international press conference. Here the Tsar, Tsarina, and uh, one, two, three, four, five, five children. Firstly, the sample said to have come from Anna Anderson could not be associated with a maternal relative of the Tsarina or of His Royal Highness Prince Philip. The genetic testing proved beyond all reasonable doubt that Anna Anderson was not Anastasia Romanov. The whole thing was fabricated. Whoever she was, she certainly wasn't, wasn't a member of the Russian royal family. This was a fantastic story in a time in which there are a lot of fantastic stories. It turned out that Anna Anderson had been born in Poland in 1896 and had a long history of psychological problems before emigrating to Germany in 1920. It was shown that she was, in fact, a, a Polish factory worker called Franziska Szankowska, and DNA tests were done to prove her connection to that. As the investigators were unable to explain why two bodies were still missing, the Russian Orthodox Church refused to preside over the burial of the bones found in Yekaterinburg. The official ceremony to rebury the Romanov remains in 1998 went ahead on the strength of DNA testing done in Russia and America and Britain, I think, as well, and but without the official sanction of the Russian Orthodox Church. Despite the overwhelming DNA evidence that supports the fact that, that this, these were the graves of the Romanovs, um, there are still people today, especially in Russia, who just don't accept it. This includes the Orthodox Church in Russia, who simply still can't accept that Tsar met his end in this way. What little they have said is that, oh, you know, we need to satisfy ourselves that, that this is the Russian royal family. We will undertake our own scientific investigation. But while investigators were able to solve the Anna Anderson mystery, in doing so, they created another. If Anderson was not the missing princess, then where was she? The search was now on to find out once and for all what really happened to the missing Romanov children. It took over 15 years and numerous archaeological digs, but persistence finally paid off. After excavating a site less than 70 meters from the first grave, they made another startling find. But in 2007, an, an amateur archaeologist discovered another pit um, containing remains, and they were the remains of, a, of an adolescent boy, um, the Tsarevich, Alexei, and a girl, um, aged between, I think, 17 and 20, which, which would have made her either Anastasia or Maria. Now, this Russian team of scientists have concluded Anastasia was murdered with the Romanovs in 1918. The work done at Oldermaston meant crushing bone to extract mitochondrial DNA. Genetic material passed only through the mother. It was compared with samples from living relatives on the maternal line. One was Prince Philip, his DNA exactly matching that of his great aunt, the Tsarina, and her daughters. This proves once and for all that those two graves in the Ekaterinburg hold or held the remains of the Romanovs. For more than 70 years, the fate of Tsar Nicholas II and the last Russian royal family has fascinated the Western world. Their murder by a Bolshevik firing squad brutalized the Russian Revolution. But communism had no time for sentiment. Soviet history books dismissed the act as revolutionary justice. So laying the Romanovs to rest may help their people begin to come to terms 
with what has happened to them in the intervening 75 years. conspiracies, lies, and press attention that the Romanov mystery received. It would be easy to forget that at the heart of this story was a husband, wife, and five children whose lives were cut tragically short in what is still considered one of the darkest times in their country's history. There is still a certain kind of romance attached to that. To tragedy, there is a kind of romance. And so it would have been appealing to have thought that maybe this young Grand Duchess had been spirited away into the forest. I think you'd have to be inhuman not to want to believe that at least one of the Grand Duchesses or um, the Tsarevich Alexei had survived that horrific massacre. If you looked at the photographs of the imperial family and those four grand duchesses all in identical white dresses and the beautiful hats and the, you know, the, the gloves and, and the little boy in the sailor costume, who would believe that anybody would be capable of shooting and bayoneting these beautiful and innocent creatures? The murders of the Romanov royal family were the start of a nearly century-long mystery. It spawned hundreds of archaeological digs, countless tabloid stories, and produced numerous imposters claiming to have survived the massacre. Just how had so many people been duped into believing that anyone could possibly have made it out alive? We have to confront this ridiculous myth at this point about the bullets bouncing off the girls. The bullets did not bounce off them. They weren't flak jackets. The reason it took so long to kill them all was because the, the murderers were so inept and there was pandemonium and screaming and running around and thick, acrid smoke. In a word, Yurovsky was an incompetent. You know, he made a complete hash of the execution, he made a complete hash of the burials, and most of the controversies that exist to this very day can be traced back to the incompetency of this revolutionary. And, and it shows that history is always a, a living thing, despite their deaths. You know, the stories of these people will always live. And of course, with someone like Anastasia, her story was always clouded and was always you know, muddied by so much nonsense and all these imposters. And it's great to be able to visit the tomb now and see her there finally at rest. <laughs>